I should not have let him stay as long as he has. You mumble to yourself, unable to take your eyes off the sleeping Baka Gokatsuki. Pro hero, ground zero. Gaslighting, cheating, ex-boyfriend. But he looks so comfortable. You whine uncontrollably. After the massage, you two drew out a blackboard and began connecting names to other names. Then to documented receipts and orders. It became a long process, and you were probably going to spend the next day continuing your work, but you were close. So close. You wanted to act now. Go check out the place Bakugo had found. But he'd said that wasn't rational. He was right, you knew, but you couldn't help yourself. You looked up both names and places, you didn't recognize the person in the photo, but you did know the place. It was a well-known crack house, built around an old warehouse. Your heart clenches every time you think of that little girl, Melly, being around strange people. The theory they wanted her was because of her quirk. Location. If she could locate any missing, lost, or hidden thing, which was great for finding the elements they needed in certain types of rocks to make their drugs. You wanted to punch every single person that laid their filthy hands on her. That poor girl. You just couldn't imagine. Come here. His voice startled you out of your thoughts. You turned his way. Bakugo rolled over on the couch, facing you, but only his head. The rest of his body still facing the other side. You hated how your body automatically followed his instructions. You stopped in front of the couch, looking down at him. He rolled his eyes, although it was sloppy because he was, like, half asleep. You still caught it, though. He held out his hand. Confused, you placed yours carefully in his. In one swift move, just like back in his office, he pulled your entire body across his and rolled back over at the same time. Now, you were facing the back of your couch with Bakugo's arms around you. Bakugo Katsuki's arms around you. The pro hero Ground Zero's arms around you. Your gaslighting, cheating ex-boyfriend's arms around you. And you didn't know how to feel. You were conflicted confused, comfortable, and all of the freaking above. What? You choked out. What are you doing? Shh. He hushed you. Just go to sleep. But you couldn't. Did he really think you could go to sleep like this? With his heart beating against your back? Nostalgia flooded your everything. Your mind was overcome with memories. They were brought by his smell which was a mix of the same cologne he wore, and for some reason, firewood. They were all brought back by his touch and closeness and by his breath, which you heard every time he inhaled and exhaled. Bakugo? You called again. He grunted, but you had a feeling his eyes were still closed. For some reason, this embarrassed you and you had no idea why. It was a stupid question but your mouth went dry the second you tried to ask. Even so, you forced it out. What's with that photo? What? Of us, on your personal profile, I mean, it's still up, I just... You were speaking too fast for your brain to keep up, so you closed your eyes and slowed your words down, allowing your thoughts to run through before you spoke them. I was just curious, you know? Bakugo's eyes opened. Well, that's what you assumed. It wasn't like you could see him. His answer sounded more clear, which is why you assumed he'd opened his eyes, maybe even blinked a few times before speaking. You're never just curious. The way he said it sent butterflies fluttering around in your stomach. He said it as if no time had passed, as if he knew you just as much as he did back then. You tried to remind yourself what kind of person he was and why you broke up with him, that all you could think was, I like how he said that. A gruff sigh came from his lips, 
followed by his answer, I don't know. It was another answer you didn't really like. It was mysterious and vague, much like he didn't know how to answer you. But how were you supposed to respond to that? What were you supposed to say? Bakugo. Um, uh, you go first. You say, blushing slightly. It was an awkward silence, unsure of who was to speak first. But you told him he could speak, so why was he keeping quiet? Your mind spun and overthought until his voice broke your conversation with yourself inside your head. I saw you on the news one day. He what? It sounds stupid, but I saw you with a reporter. You had just saved a family from a fire. You remember that day. It was one of your first, bigger jobs. You thought you should say something to acknowledge it, but figured it was too late. You had taken too long contemplating it, so you kept quiet and let him continue. I saw the family. They were so young, barely any older than we are right now. You held your breath and waited for the inevitable. You don't know how he was going to say it, but whatever it was, it would break your heart. Crack it fully into two pieces. I imagined they were us. Bakugo squeezed your hand, and it was only then that you realized you were crushing his. Back then, you started forcing the tears back into your eye sockets. You couldn't do this to him, much less to yourself. You didn't deserve this. Neither of you did. You can't go back in time. Even if you could, you know you wouldn't be able to change a single thing. Fate wants what it wants, and it always will. If fate wanted you to be together, you would be. Back then, he pegged, but you didn't know what to say. You couldn't go forward with your original statement, but you didn't know how not to. I. Your breath hitched. If you continue, you would burst into tears. You would do the opposite of what you promised yourself you would do. Shut up, you whispered at your heart. Just shut up, Ellen. You were shaking your head now. Someone was waiting for you. Someone amazing and perfect and just right. They didn't get angry or too protective or cheat. They definitely didn't cheat because they would love you and only you and Katsuki Bakugo is not that person. You untangled yourself from his hold, no matter how hard it was. No matter the lump in your throat, threatening to choke you to death. No matter what your heart was screeching at you, nothing was worth getting hurt again. No one was worth it. Not a single fucking person. You turned your body and face. Then you sat up. Bakugo mimicked you, and you forced your eyes to meet his, knowing he had to know what you were about to say was not practiced. Not some Nancy Winker poem or plead. He looked back, and damn it if you didn't want to hug him. Pull him close and go to sleep like you were first years again. You fought against his tempting eyes, his tempting arms, his tempting everything. I love you. His face stayed calm and neutral. It was his shield, his armor, his way of saying, I hear you, but I don't want to. You reached out and brushed a strand of hair out of his face. His features always looked so sharp, so rigid, but as soon as you touched him, you felt it quiver. Bakugo's body shook like he was cold, freezing. I loved you so much, and damn it if I don't love you now. Bakugo's eyes relaxed a little, like his armor was breaking just that much but it was enough to make you finish. But you hurt me. You hurt me. You were shaking your head again, feeling a box close around your heart. You watched him take his right hand and slowly wipe the warm tear that fell just then. I can't put myself through that. Then harder, stronger, I won't. Ellen, Ellen, look at me. You looked up, you watched him, and knew, knew he was telling the truth. Mina likes 
girls. It took you a second to process what he was saying. Sure, you hear rumors, but gossip is gossip, and you've known since you were never to trust a tabloid unless it was quoted. Your heart stopped. Hell, your mind stopped. I never, never cheated on you. I could never. I... He cut himself off, looked away, then said, I was there that day because I was calming her down. I was helping her break the news to her parents. She didn't want Denki to know. She didn't want anyone to know until she told her parents. She... I found out by accident. She was on FaceTime in the morning. I heard, saw. He shook his head. Again, it was none of my business. But she knew I knew, and she needed support. Ellen, she was my friend, always will be. Images of that day flashed in your mind. You, Ochako, Izuku, Shoto, and Momo, you were all hanging out that day. Bakugo had said he had something important to do. Then Ashido told Kirishima the same thing. Kaminari, Jiro, and Kirishima had stayed home with mostly everyone else since it was a Saturday. You had wanted to go out, so you insisted Ochako and Momo come with you. Then Shoto and Izuku ended up tagging along. Lita was visiting family, so he was a no-show. The whole scene ran through your head over and over again. The five of you walking into the restaurant, the five of you ordering, the five of you sitting down, the five of you noticing two of your classmates sitting with two older people, the four of them watch as you went to go see what the hell your boyfriend was doing, meeting the parents of your supposed friend, you accusing, you crying, your boyfriend trying to explain without overstepping, you running away. You pushed out of him and began pacing, taking in all of this newfound information. Then you cringed as you thought back to the night Bakugo walked in on you and Shoto. Shit. Bakugo. You turned to look at him, but again, he was shaking his head. I didn't- we weren't- He held up his hand. No, Ellen. You didn't know. You were angry. You had every right Fucking to be- Fucking listen to me. Bakugo's eyes widened. He shut his mouth as you let out an exasperated sigh. Fuck. You whimpered. Feeling your legs wobble, you ran a hand down your face and stared at him, communicating with everything you could. Shoda was helping me study. We got, we got tired. I wanted to watch a movie, and yes, I was angry, I was pissed. I didn't want anyone to pity me. I hate that look. I hate when people pity me, you know this. You regained your composure. You took a shuddering breath, and then you let your feet collapse. You fell into a crisscross, then you looked up, unsure of how to get everything you wanted to say out in the open within the span of five seconds. You took a few deep breaths tried to form words in your head, then opened your mouth. He was... I was... He asked, and I... I don't know. You waved your hands. I trusted him. I broke down, okay? I told him how I felt about everything since that day, and then he let me stay the night. You faced Bakugo. You wanted to make sure he was watching your eyes when you said this, and when he was, you said, Shoto consoled me. We talked, and I cried, and I was too tired. It was too late to try and sneak back to my room, so he let me stay the night. In the morning, when you found us, I was still so angry. I thought, why not let you believe whatever you wanted? Then we would be even, and you would know you hadn't hurt me as bad as you did. Again, silence enveloped the space between you two. It was still awkward, but somewhat better than before. Somehow, okay. You watched his face and knew he was thinking the same thing you were. What happens now? You decided to finish your case before you talked about anything personal. You and Bakugo watched each document, each sticky note, and looked in and out of perspective to figure out how to go about your plan. Eventually, you told Bakugo, who most likely already knew that the people you were looking for weren't that smart, 
but they weren't that dumb either. Sooner or later, they were going to be on the move again, and then you'd have to start all over again. So, you formed your plan. Picking and choosing the best members for your team, you were thinking about asking Invisible Girl for a favor. Her ability would be very useful for this, but you didn't want to make it seem like the only reason you reached out to her was to ask for a favor. You knew you were going to have to do this alone. Well, with Bakugo, but alone. We need someone with a sensibility quirk, Bakugo stated, his right hand resting on his chin, and he sat with one leg crossed, the other out, propping up his arm. You're right. You were looking at the white papers scattered around you, your face completely serious. Any ideas? Bakugo rubbed his left eye and smiled. Never thought I'd hear you say that again. His smile was mischievous and playful and very, very flirtatious, but as soon as your head snapped up, so did your arm. At his leg, to be exact, you rolled your eyes backward and forward. Not the time. His smile disappeared, but not fully. It was a little content as he watched your work mindset kick into overdrive. At that moment, he thought, you needed a vacation. So, any ideas? You ask again, scrolling through your phone now, looking at the different sidekicks under your label. Bakugo answered swiftly, pulling out his phone as well. Yeah, I have a few. Your phone vibrated, an email had been sent through. That's a list of sensibility sidekicks from my label. He leaned back on his hands as you clicked on the link, scrolling the names and photos. I specifically like Astro for this role, precisely because- Okay, now we need a stealthy hero. I have someone in mind who's small and able to get into tiny spaces easily. Then that just leaves. He trails off as you look up to meet his gaze. Someone with lots of mobility. You say at the same time. Okay, let me think. He says again, leaning back on his hands and staring at the ceiling. Normally, I would vouch for Livy, but... You bit your lip, looking away, remembering Ares' rescue all too well. It was dangerous, and you almost died. Hell, people did die. You didn't want to put Livy in that situation, not caring at all how selfish of an act it is. Bakugo stared at you mindlessly, understanding your unsaid words all too well. Bakugo might not have gone on the mission to save Eri, but you sure as hell told him everything that happened afterward. How could you not have? He found you in a minor coma at the hospital after you had been avoiding him for days. He had slept in his bed that night, and a few nights after that, not bothering to care about the questions everyone seemed so fond of asking. Bakugo knew you. He knew you had your reasons for keeping this mission a secret, and he respected that. You shudder, thinking about Tomru's cold, gloved hand wrapped around your neck. You swallowed thickly and forced the memory away. However, like before, it didn't go away. Unconsciously, you had wrapped an arm around yourself, as if back in that place. You never really got over that mission. God knows it was the hardest thing you'd had to endure at UA, but it was definitely worth it. You didn't know much about your other classmates or keep in contact with many of them, but you did talk to your old sensei, Aizawa, and from him, you knew that mostly everyone kept in contact with Eri, yourself and Bakugo included. When do we leave? Bakugo asked you, cool red eyes watching the floor. You answered him immediately. As soon as we get everyone in the same damn car. His eyes broke away from the floor and watched yours. Slowly, a small smile emerged from his face. You looked at him with a bit of suspicion. You raise a single eyebrow. What? Bakugo shakes his head in disbelief. I don't think I've ever heard you curse. You narrow your eyes. Bullshit, everyone has. He shakes his head, his expression mixed with pride and appalled. Do it again. He pegs. Your eyes narrow and you stand, smacking him on the back. You say, get the hell up and call your sidekick. Bakugo listens to your instructions and begins typing on his phone. You walk off into the kitchen, 
ready to email the higher-ups office. Once you type out a small paragraph, you go to your call log and find Elf's number. You dial it, get him on board, and hang up. He'll be meeting outside your house in a few minutes. Bakugo walks in and looks at you for more instructions. He never thought he'd willingly play puppet. It fills you with something like arrogance. You shake the thought and throw him your keys. Start the car and enter the coordinates. He catches the keys, nods, and walks off briskly, physically and mentally preparing himself. Of course, though, he didn't bring his hero outfit, and so you need to stop at his house before you go anywhere. You should have planned this out more carefully. You smack yourself internally and drag a hand down your face externally. Huffing, you ran into your room and grabbed your hero outfit. You threw the extra pieces of your outfit into a bag and ran after Bakugo while dialing Tiger's number. She was the second person you thought of, next to Livy, of course. She's an excellent fighter and loves putting the lives in their place. Not only that, everything from her skin to her costume is as dark as midnight, giving her even more usefulness in this mission. As soon as Bakugo had a clear deadway for his house, he hit the gas. You were speaking quickly, but thankfully, Tiger's ears were just as fast as her legs. Bakugo ran inside his house to change while you changed in the car. It was quick and a little uncomfortable, but you got the job done. He came running out a few minutes later. You were pulling up into your driveway when Bakugo got a call from his sidekick. Tiger was there already, as expected. You were just waiting on Elf. You were driving now, with Bakugo in the passenger seat. A small car pulled up and you knew it had to be Elf's. He jumped out of the car and you shouted at your car window, Get in the back! You pulled off, watching Bakugo, ground zero, punch in the coordinates as he did so. You filled the group in on what was going on and why you had chosen them for this mission. So far, everyone understood the main concept of what was going on. Even if things were moving way too fast and your head was spinning, you knew your objective, and that is what kept you sane. The drive was about an hour to an hour and a half long. Once you were close enough, you pulled off to the side of the road, where trees toppled on one another. It was dark, and the eerie countryside quiet didn't do much to help. Alright, I want to go over the plan one last time, Ground Zero whispered as you turned the car off. Everyone went quiet, not that there was much chatter on the way here. You all just went over the plan hundreds of times, hoping that by doing so, no one would forget their part. Bakugo pointed toward Astro. You use your quirk to sense the capacity of how many people are there. He wiggled his earpiece, using this to communicate with Elf. The two of you should be able to scout out the place and report back to us without anyone noticing. We'll need to split up to look for the girl. He looked down, paused for a moment, then looked back up. I will go alone. No! Your immediate protest was unexpected, and you knew how stupid it sounded, but you didn't want to get separated from him. Ground Zero looked at you, his eyes perplexed as he said, We don't have a choice. He looked back at the group. I'll go alone. We're all in agreement? You looked away, out your window, not wanting to agree. All right then. Ground Zero looked back at you, his eyes lingering on yours for a moment too long. Whisper will go with Tiger, an elf... You and Astro would team up. Ground Zero pulled a photo out of his pocket. He flicked it once. This girl is our priority. Her safety is all we care about at the moment. And until you get word from me or Whisper, nothing changes. He raised an eyebrow. Got that? The three sidekicks nodded. And he nodded with them. Okay, let's go. He jumped out of the car, but stayed still. The others had already taken off toward the warehouse. But you watched the sky for a moment watched the moon and the stars, sending up a silent prayer for the safety of all your teammates, but mostly for Ground Zero. You knew you'd said you'd talk about things with him once this mission was all over, but the fact was, neither of you might come out of this mission alive. If it is as dangerous as Ares' rescue had been, there's a pretty good chance you won't get to tell him ever again how much you've never stopped loving him. So... You sent up another silent prayer that he already knew. Eventually, you ran after your team, wishing you had a chance to redo everything. Because now you knew that everything you thought you knew of Katsuki Bakugo was a lie. Hey, 
Tiger greeted. You had found them on the roof of a building. Elf had already been sent inside. Now, all you had to do was wait for him to get back. Only, he never would. You had been waiting for minutes upon minutes. That is, until a staticky sensation came from Astro's earpiece. He'd yanked it off and thrown it on the ground, squinting at it. What? What happened? You looked at him expectantly. He gave a disgusted shake of his head. You looked at Ground Zero, and he looked back, as if reading each other's minds. He looked back at the group. All right, change of plans. We storm the place. But isn't that dangerous? Tiger asked cautiously. Ground Zero glared, and an odd thought forged should sway into the front of your mind. There he is. We've already been found out, he said. It'd be dangerous if we stayed up here. Besides, if they know we're here, they're going to want to move their merchandise as quickly as possible, and we can't let that happen. He locked eyes with you once more, and an emotion flashed upon his face. One you hadn't seen in over two years. Fear. He jumped down the hole they'd created, followed by Astro. Tiger looked at you nervously. You gave her your best assured smile, then followed them into the hole. There were only two ways to go, so you chose randomly and told Tiger to go the opposite way. She followed instructions and sprinted down the hall. There were doors on each side and a window at the very end of the hall. You looked at the stairs, assuming Astro or Ground Zero, however went this way as well, had taken them because you could hear nothing but quietness. You watched your footsteps, trying to keep as quiet as possible. You moved slowly in the direction of a single door, hearing muffled cries. You try the knob. It's locked. You prepare to kick the door in, counting to three. One. You take in a breath. Two. You take in another. Three. Someone attacks from behind. They try to force a bag over your head, but you wisp just in time. You wisped back toward the stairs. There was a large shadow, and as soon as it saw what had happened, it disappeared. You ran back toward the crying door and kicked it open. There were tons of garbage bags everywhere. It would take you days to search them all. Instead, you yelled, trying to listen to where the cry came from the loudest. You almost tripped over a bag, but thankfully you dodged it. You called out to the crying person. Hello? Can you hear me? You were finally able to pick up wrestling along with the weeping and found a large gray bag moving like it was holding a large fish. Frantically, you rushed over toward the bag. It was heavy and you tore through it like paper. First it was legs, then arms and the wailing was horrible. You were trying to calm the person down, realizing it was a girl, realizing it was the girl. You're okay, you're okay, kept repeating toward her, pulling her into your lap. You're okay, I promise. She was crying for her mother. There were fresh scars all over her legs and arms, and you hated to think of what she'd been going through. You felt yourself begin to break down, still repeating, You're okay, you're okay. No, she's not. The same voice from before whispered into your ear. Shivers ran up and down your body, and the girl screamed louder. She clearly did not want to be around that thing, and if you were being honest, neither were you. You gripped her shoulders and whispered into her ear, Hold on. And then you whisked. You were back on the roof again, trying to comfort the young girl. A flash of light sent you flying. Then something appeared. It looked like the shadow from before, only... This time, it was sporting a human being, and the shadow only surrounded the man. This man, whom you did not recognize. He ran toward you, and you wisped, right behind him, throwing a punch toward his neck as soon as you could. Your fist went through the mist as the shadow man wrapped his entire body around your waist, his fist wrapping around your neck. You did everything you could to fight him off, but found you could only wisp away from him. For short periods of time at that, because he would just appear next to you a few seconds later. This little game of cat and mouse was not helping. All it was accomplishing was tiring you out, which, now that you think about it, might actually be the goal of this. How could you be so stupid? Fight me like the man you're supposed to be. His laugh bellowed all around you. 
the night, making it harder and harder to keep conscious. Fine, you said, trying to catch your breath. I get it. You're scared. Another deep, dark, and rich chuckle. Scared? You are a mere mortal. So, you admit it? You're scared of me? A mere mortal? He did not like the sound of that. He rushed toward you, and you whisked again, this time very, very close to the edge of the building, which wouldn't be a problem if you had not been almost completely out of energy. The shadow rushed toward you again, and this time you did not have the energy to continue. You tried, but it was futile. You hear shouting and screaming and crying, but couldn't place it. The little girl was rushing toward you. You were trying to tell her to run away, that it wasn't safe, but she wasn't listening. It's my fault, she was saying. He's hurting you because of me. And God damn it, you would not be bullied by a fucking shadow. No, you shouted, or at least tried. No, it's... Your throat constricted again, feeling warm tears falling freely down your cheeks. Why in? You heard a shout. Looking around, you spotted Bakugo. No, that wasn't right. He was in uniform now, so that must mean you were supposed to address him as Ground Zero. Gods, Wayan. His eyes looked puffy and damp. Very, very damp. Bakugo? Let him go. His voice was angry, hard, and painful. You heard explosions, but you were starting to drift in and out of consciousness. You couldn't keep your head up by yourself. Don't do this, you managed to shout, somehow still keeping consciousness. Through this, you spotted Tiger and Astro. Save the girl, you shouted, but it came out as a whisper. The Shadow Man was fighting off Ground Zero, still clutching your neck in his hands. Although his grip was loosening a little, you were able to get a little air. Whatever it did, it kept you from dying. Damn it, Ground Zero let out a growl. You two, get the girl, get her out of here, now! Tiger and Astro acted as fast as they could, with Shadow Man hot on their tails. They managed, just with Ground Zero's help. He was smacked across the rooftop, though, which broke one of his gas tanks. He didn't seem to mind, though, as he wiped his blood-streaked face. It made you so sad to see him this way. He rushed toward you, and the Shadow Man, I said, let them go! With pleasure. The shadow man gripped your neck again, and you felt yourself slowly drifting off to an unpleasant dream. You barely felt it as the shadow man flung you off the rooftop. You heard a scream, but knew it wasn't your own. You were too exhausted to scream. Now, you just wanted peace. The girl was saved. That's all you wanted to do. And now that she was, you had nothing else to worry about. You were falling until you weren't. The last thing you heard was, Damn it, don't die on me, you idiot. Katsuki? You whispered, although you were sure it was in your head. However, then you heard, You called me Katsuki. He said, almost cheerful, Now you definitely can't die. Then, everything went black. 